Okay, everyone, welcome. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Kate Stewart. I'm the Assistant Director at the Brett Office of Career Development Aspire Program. Uh, with Vanderbilt's Corporate and Foundation Relations, the Aspire team is co-sponsoring this event by the Burroughs Welcome Fund. Um, I will be moderating the Q&A. So um, if you see that Q&A box at the bottom, that's where you use it to um, submit questions for our panel. And then if you have technical issues, please use the chat feature. Um, unique about the Q&A box is that um, if someone proposes a question that you are going to ask, you can upvote that so that it can get higher up in the priority list. And so I, I encourage you to take a look at the Zoom um, Q&A box. If you don't see a question that, um, that has already been asked, go ahead and ask it and we'll, we'll address that. Um, and again, technical issues in the chat box. But it is now my pleasure to introduce Larry Marnett, our Dean of School of Medicine Basic Sciences for some opening remarks. So thanks, Larry. Thank you very much, Kate. As Dean of the School of Medicine Basic Sciences, I'm grateful to welcome the team from Burroughs Welcome Fund today. who will be discussing their career awards at the Scientific Interface. These awards bridge advanced postdoctoral training and the first three years of faculty service. Now more than ever, with the impacts of COVID-19 and uncertainty around NIH funding, private philanthropy plays a critical role in supporting both early career researchers and advancing cutting edge, cutting edge basic science. Burroughs Welcome Fund has been a leader in this space since 1955 and continues to be a key organization nationally dedicated to advancing biomedical sciences, research, education, and diversity in the field. The fund has also impacted Vanderbilt faculty and trainees greatly over the years and recently funded a two and a half million dollar institutional award to help both bolster the dwindling number of active physician scientists, as well as the grant to the Brett Office to support a data science education module in the Aspire program. From the Burroughs Welcome Fund, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Lou Muglia, their president and CEO. Lou and I have known each other for more than a decade since we collaborated as colleagues here at Vanderbilt when Lou was Vice Chair for Research Affairs in Pediatrics at the UMC. Dr. Muglia assumed his current leadership role at Burroughs Welcome Fund at the beginning of this year. However, he has been involved with the fund for more than 20 years, first as an award recipient in the same year as John York, by, that, by the way, and then as a member of their advisory and review boards. Dr. Muglia is an international leader in genetic, epidemiologic, and molecular biologic investigations, seeking to reveal the determinants of birth timing and risk for preterm birth in human pregnancy. In 2017, Dr. Muglia led a landmark study of 50,000 women, which identified several common maternal polymorphisms that shape preterm birth risk and serve as new targets for intervention. Among Dr. Muglia's achievements are more than 260 publications, many awards, and election as a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and membership in the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Muglia also served as chair of the Board of Scientific Counselors for the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development of the National Institutes of Health. Prior to joining Burroughs Welcome Fund, Dr. Muglia held leadership roles at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, as I said earlier, and Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Muglia earned his MD and PhD degrees from the University of Chicago and a Bachelor of Science degree in biophysics from the University of Michigan. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Muglia and his team. Lou, thank you so much for being here and for all the support that the Burroughs Welcome Fund provides to our basic science community. Well, Larry, thank you for that marvelous introduction. I'm truly honored and flattered. And good morning, everyone that's on this webinar. I'm sure many people are webinared out at this point, but this is, I, I hope, an opportunity where you can learn a little bit about our organization, about what we're about and how we would like to engage you folks at Vanderbilt. I have incredibly fond memories of my time at Vanderbilt and appreciate the depth of talent that there is there across disciplines. And that's why we particularly look forward to encouraging you to think about our various career award programs and particularly the career awards and the scientific interfaces. So I am joined here with colleagues from um, the Burroughs Welcome Fund, 
uh, Dr. Kelly Rose, who uh, is our program officer that leads the career awards in the scientific interfaces program. Melanie Scott, um, our program associate, senior program associate that works very closely with Kelly in implementation. And then Russ Campbell, our communications officer, who is responsible for all of our science communications and um, providing information related to our requests for proposals. Um, all of us are here at your disposal. Um, we look forward to being contacted, myself and all of the people I've introduced to you, with any questions that come up after this webinar. Um, so we do look forward to engaging you, having you think very seriously about the programs. And if you're questioning whether these programs are right for you, again, those are things we love talking about. With that, I thought I would begin with a little bit of an introduction to the fund and then turn it over to Kelly to talk more specifically about our programs. So Kelly, may I have you bring up the slides, please? Great, maybe, ah, perfect. Um, next slide. So what I'll be doing today is giving a little bit of a, an overview of the fund, um, its history and purpose and a grant overview We'll be talking about the career awards at the scientific interfaces, and then we'll have time for questions and answers. Next slide, please. Next. So the Burroughs Welcome Fund has a long legacy. Um, we actually arose um, based on the foundation of the Burroughs Welcome Company, which was started in the 1880s by Silas Burroughs and Henry Welcome, two American um, uh, pharmaceutical scientists and um, entrepreneurs who started the company um, and actually did that in, in, in London. Um, and over the course of the 20th century, there was enormous growth based on their successes in, in drug development um, and design. Next slide, please. The Burroughs Welcome Fund was established as the philanthropic arm of the company in 1955. So we've actually been around 65 years, but that was when we had a corporate basis. Um, it was in 1993, however, that the Burroughs Welcome Fund was established as an independent nonprofit organization with a $400, $400 million gift from the Welcome Trust in 1993. So that allowed us to be free of any corporate ties. We're an independent nonprofit now, and we've actually grown that uh, endowment considerably since 1993, um, approaching $800 million and having given away $800 million in grants at the same time since 1993. Next slide. I am the third president of the Burroughs Welcome Fund. Kate Bond was the first for 14 years. John Burris was the second. And each of them developed a series of uh, programs uh, which I think uh, have served uh, the organization very well. You heard a little bit, of Larry, about our Physician Scientist Institutional Award. That was one of the things John implemented. Kata Bond really, though, was the one that began um, our sort of bridging awards at, uh, for postdocs into junior faculty positions. And those have served as a model um, that Burroughs Welcome Fund developed and that have been implemented widely across other organizations right now. Next slide, please. So the primary missions of the Burroughs Welcome Fund are to help scientists early in their careers develop as independent investigators. We really view that as our priority and to advance fields in the basic biomedical sciences that are undervalued or in need of particular encouragement. Um, we have a robust but not infinite um, uh, asset portfolio. So we wanna make sure we're investing wisely where we can have substantial impact. Next slide, please. How will we measure our success in achieving these missions? You can click down, Kelly. Number of scientists, especially physician scientists, we have supported to become successful independent investigators. Diversity is extraordinarily important to us. Geographic diversity and individual demographics. Determining the number of transformative researchers and scientific questions we have invested in, particularly in underfunded areas. And then quantifying the number of discoveries that have led to changes in human health. We want to have impact broadly. So next slide. So we really believe that there is a lack of diverse biomedical research community and a shortfall in investment in specific areas of importance. Several of these are listed here. And you can see the third bullet point down is integration of physical and biological sciences, which is really the motivation for the career awards at the scientific interfaces, which you'll hear more about. Um, to make impact in these areas, 
Um, our goal is to provide research funding with attention to early stage investigators. We additionally have diversity enrichment programs and we um, robustly invest in North Carolina K through 12 education programs. Next slide. Our mission statement is here. Um, the Burroughs Welcome Fund serves and strengthens society by nurturing a diverse group of leaders in biomedical sciences to improve human health through education, empowering discovery and frontiers of the greatest need. The image on the left-hand side of this slide um, shows our annual report, which we're happy to provide to you and uh, can be downloaded from our website as well. Um, and on the right-hand side of the panel just shows that we invested in more than $50 million in new research grants during fiscal year 2019. Um, the Interfaces programs um, accounts for about 13% of that. Our biomedical sciences defined broadly as institutional and individual awards was almost half of that portfolio. And then we have other interesting programs like our pathogenesis of infectious disease. Um, Eric Scar is one of our advisory committee members there and I believe a past awardee. Um, we invest heavily in reproductive sciences and innovations in regulatory sciences as well. Next slide. So again, when we talk about committing to diversity, um, we um, think about individual demographic components, um, race and ethnicity, age, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, and we do want to be a voice for social justice in terms of evening the playing field for individuals of all color and background to be able to compete successfully for our awards and awards and from all other organizations as well. Next slide. And so thinking about the future uh, of Burroughs Welcome Fund, um, we're go undergoing ongoing assessment of current programs for direction and impact. Um, our, I, we're identifying new areas for prioritization, including integration of science and the arts, especially around science communication and data visualization. Through all of our programs, including the CASI program, we're interested in approaches that um, use theoretical and quantitative modeling of complex systems. Um, sometimes incorporating climate change in human health, and then any special considerations around COVID-19 as well. Next slide. So again, we want to maintain our, our current reputation um, of our brand. We want to become increasingly recognized as an organization of thought leaders in developing research agendas. And then we want to utilize the Burroughs Welcome Fund headquarters to increase vibrancy of the academic environment overall by engaging other philanthropic organizations, but also supporting think tank meetings and ad hoc grants that we also um, invest in. So for those of you that are not aware of it, in addition to our competitive award programs, we take um, requests for proposals in many areas that allow development of workshops, symposia, and other endeavors um, that uh, are cross-institutional and um, do not sort of circumvent our competitive programs. Next slide. We're part of the Science Philanthropy Alliance, which engages now uh, 40 um, philanthropic organizations. Next slide. Many, some of those are shown here, like the HHMI, uh, the Packard Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, the Templeton Foundation. But what we're happy to do as well is for our awardees and people that engage with us as part of the Burroughs Welcome Fund family, we're happy to connect you with these other philanthropic organizations that we think might be good fits as well to increase the funding opportunities that you may have beyond the size of our current award programs. And we look forward to partnering um, to accomplish that as well. Next slide. Here's a picture of our lovely Burroughs Welcome Fund headquarters where I am sitting right now. Um, normally for our career awards, we would invite our finalists down to the headquarters to interview in person with the, um, with the uh, advisory committee members. Everything has gone virtual for right now. Uh, we have a fantastic advisory committee team, but even these virtual engagements um, with interviews with each of the finalists that we just experienced about a month ago have all gone extremely well. So we look forward to the next round. We hope um, to solicit interest from you all and engage questions. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly now to tell you a little bit more about Cassie. Great. Thanks, Lou. Uh, so I'm going to start with just giving an overview of the grant programs at Burroughs Welcome Fund, and then we'll focus a little bit more on uh, Cassie. Uh, so um, as you know, I am the program officer in charge of the 
interfaces and science. I also run the regulatory sciences program. So if you have any questions about those programs, uh, let me know. Uh, Victoria McGovern is our program officer in infectious disease. Alfred Mays is our program officer in science education and diversity. Uh, Raleigh Simpson runs our biomedical sciences and reproductive sciences program. And uh, as mentioned earlier, Russ Campbell is our, in charge of our communications output. So um, the Career Awards and Scientific Interface, or CASI, is a five-year, $500,000 postdoc faculty bridging award uh, meant to support the early career development of researchers from you know, a variety of different fields to focus on biological questions. So the purpose of the interfaces program in general is to encourage the convergence of the biological and the non-biological sciences. And uh, BWF has uh, supported this in, in a variety of different ways. We've supported short courses, we've supported uh, institutional awards in the past, and then now our, our flagship program being CASI. The main goal is always focused on the training and support of investigators who are working at the intersection of these traditionally disparate fields. CASI was uh, modeled closely on the career awards in the biomedical sciences program, CABS, which ran from 1995 to 2006. Uh, CASI um, began alongside CABS in 2001, had a couple of different suspensions along the years, but um, has been running uh, continuously since 2011. Uh, it used to be a uh, institutional nomination but in 2011, at the request of our advisory committee, we opened the application process to allow self-nominations. Some of the highlights, uh, as we said, uh, BWF um, is interested in funding this convergent science, but we uh, have a very broad definition of what that entails. Um, we just ask that it be interdisciplinary and collaborative. Um, high risk of, um, projects are rewarded with flexible spending and, and the freedom to pivot uh, within the project as, as needed. We have a great interdisciplinary advisory board that adapts to the trends in the applicant pool. And many of our awardees have gone on to get um, significant funding across federal agency and private funders. Uh, we're, we're happy to, to say that 146 out of our 175 CASI awardees have transitioned into faculty positions. And when we look at uh, startup packages across um, our, these 146 awardees who have transitioned, we do see gender equality in these startup packages. And as a CASI awardee, we do um, offer support during that negotiation process. And what we found is that our awardees seem to have a warmer, warmer hiring reception um, over a quarter of them have secondary appointments, which makes sense since their work is interdisciplinary. And we've awarded 17 cycles uh, for over $90 million committed and 80 million already paid out. This is a look at the applicant pool over the past five years. If you can focus here on the number of proposals or look down here on this table. We've steadily increased since 2015 and we're now uh, very readily approaching the, the 300 uh, mark. When we look at the applicant pool, we can see over a third um, steadily rising is female applicants. We've risen from about 40% to about 45% of temporary visa holders and uh, underrepresented minorities make up uh, six to eight percent of our uh, application pool. And so we're really interested in increasing those numbers. For last year in particular, we had 279 uh, pre-proposals. From those, 92 were eligible to move to full proposal. 90 went forward. Um, the full proposals were due January um, 8th. And then at the advisory committee meeting in April, eight awardees were made, were, eight awards were made. And uh, Russ has put out on social media this um, one pager um, announcing the recipients of the 2020 Career Awards. And you can also find that on our website. So this is just an example of, as I mentioned before, the, the, the really 
um, fantastic careers that our CASI awardees have gone on to, to, um, to have. I'm not going to read out all of these awards for each individual, but um, you know, these are definitely um, names in the field you might recognize. Just Michael Elowitz and Aviv Rogev. And even our um, more recent awardees, such as Marquita Landry, Michael Mitchell, and Kim Stroka, have a quite impressive um, award list that they've achieved since their um, their Cassie uh, debut, so to speak. So for this year's timeline, I'm sure you're all excited to hear about it. Um, Pre-proposals are due September 1st. We will then um, send those out for review and uh, pending when we get the advisory committee review numbers back, we will invite um, similar numbers as the previous years to submit full proposals and that would occur in November. Uh, we usually like to get that notification out before Thanksgiving. The full proposal deadline is January 8th in 2021. We uh, try to get the finalist notification by late March. And those finalists will present at the advisory committee meeting uh, in person or virtual, as the case may be in April of 2021. We'll go over some of the eligibility criteria that's available in the RFP, but uh, just for uh, convenience, we'll, we'll go over those here, uh, candidates must be based at a nonprofit degree granting institution, 501c3 or equivalent, in the US or Canada. They must hold a PhD degree in one of the fields of mathematics, physics, chemistry, computer science, statistics, engineering. Um, and they must have completed at least 12 months of a postdoc, but not more than 60 months by the date of the full invited application deadline. So that will be by January of 2021. They must be committed to a full-time career in research as an independent investigator, and they must not submit more than one pre-proposal per cycle, although candidates may um, apply more than once per, you know, uh, in additional years if they remain eligible. Candidates must have at least one first author publication. Co-first authorship is allowable. And their primary postdoctoral mentor must also hold an appointment at the same accredited degree at granting institution that the postdoc is currently at. Um, citizens and non-citizens, permanent and temporary residents are eligible. Uh, candidates must not have or have accepted a K99 award from the, from the NIH. Candidates may hold a K01 award, however, and uh, Postdocs who are currently at the NIH or at HHMI's Janela Farm Research Campus may also apply. However, if they are granted an award, BWF will only fund the faculty portion of it. So some of our frequently asked questions, uh, do we pay indirect costs? And the answer is no. Uh, we get this question quite a bit. Am I eligible if I have a PhD in biochemistry, biophysics? Systems biology, another one we get a lot is computational neuroscience. And um, the answer is, is most likely what, what we're really interested in is not necessarily the, the title of your PhD, but the quantitativeness or the um, approaches that you've used in your uh, research. So as long as you meet all the other eligibility criteria and can demonstrate that your work is truly interdisciplinary and using techniques from other disciplines, um, if you can prove that with your CV and your publications, then we're, we're happy to have you apply. Am I eligible if it's been 60 months since my PhD, but I was otherwise employed, took a leave of absence or uh, maternity leave, et cetera? And yeah, um, the answer is most likely, possibly, if your work experience was not in a science research field. So if you took um, otherwise employed at uh, and still engaged in science and that would not that would still count toward your 60 months. But if you took a, a job teaching somewhere or was on maternity leave that does not count towards your 60 month work experience. And I encourage you to reach out to me uh, 
to, um, to check that eligibility. Am I eligible if my title is other than postdoctoral? And uh, yes, as long as you are eligible uh, via your work experience, as long as it's at least 12 months, but not more than 60 months, um, we will accept your application. Uh, titles that we've seen uh, in applications are research associate, non-tenure track research faculty, and um, of course, all the other eligibility requirements are need to be uh, met. Am I eligible if I've accepted a faculty appointment? And of course, this does not include the non-tenure track fac research faculty that we just mentioned. But no, if you have a tenure track faculty member uh, position or in, in negotiations that um, you are not eligible for this award. If you, you have already started the application process and a faculty position is accepted after the full application deadline, so that's in January of 2021, the candidate may not start the new position until after the start date of the award, which usually happens in July, August of that year. So for complete program information with the deadlines, RFPs, uh, please visit our website, uh, bwfund.org. Uh, I think Kate was going to send the links for social media and we're happy to give our email addresses out as well to um, anybody who's looking uh, to, to send us an email for eligible, uh, additional questions. And so with that, we'll uh, let Kate moderate some of those questions. And thank you guys all for your time. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, we have a few um, Q&A um, questions here. And some of them may just be um, some quick responses to, um, to everything. If you want, we can go back to gallery view. So if there's anyone else on your team that can answer these questions as well. Okay, so... Um, can international postdocs and J-1 visa apply for the fund? I know that you sort of covered that, but I wanted to just have you respond directly. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that's what, we're one of the few award, uh, career awards that actually do allow um, temporary and, and, and um, J-1 visa holders apply. Okay. Um, some questions about biology. Is biology not one of the fields that the PhD may be in? So that will be one of the, um, the fields where we would have to see evidence that the work is interdisciplinary and is taking advantage of techniques from physics or modeling or the, you know, um, theory. Um, we'd have to take a look at the, um, the publications and, and make a judgment call on a case by case basis. Okay. Um, also, there was a question about so your definition of a postdoc, um, and if, if a staff scientist is kind of similar on, on, the, on the level of postdoc. The That's a good question. I don't think I've had that one before. Um, a staff scientist, as, as long as their work experience is less than 60 months, then yeah, I'm happy to take a look at, at that CV and make a, and make a determination. I, First, um, my first instinct is to say, as long as they, the um, eligibility criteria is met, then yes, they would be eligible. Yeah, usually those are not faculty positions. So I would think mm -hmm. as long as the time duration is not exceeded, that they would be eligible. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Does the first author publication requirement is from entire career or just postdoc? Is that from the just... Right, is that from your entire or post -op? Entire career, entire career. Okay. Um, all right, and we had to sort of discuss this. I know this is a popular question. Um, do you get feedback on the pre-proposal? So we don't ask, the, we don't have the advisory committee give um, direct feedback on the pre-proposal, no. Um, when we get to the final stages, people can reach out to me and I can, maybe uh, give some guidance one way or the other, but we don't give any formal um, pr uh, review at all. Okay. Um, many of our postdocs are from BUMC, which are is not a degree granting institution. Um, and so this particular postdoc, his mentor is affiliated with 
BU and VUMC, and he's asking about eligibility of the application. So the grant must pass through a degree granting institution. So as long as Vanderbilt and is it BUMC mm -hmm. the um, yeah. can come to an agreement of, of, of with that, we're okay with that. Melanie, did you have anything to add? No, um, but the yes, the institutional signature for the full proposal would need to come from Vanderbilt University. We are we are reconsidering that stance for other of our award programs, but we're testing the water right now. So in a year that may change, um, but for right now, for Cassie, that still is the case. Okay, um, I I think that might have answered our our next question about elaborating the eligibility questions about where your um, postdoctoral sponsor will hold a faculty appointment. So I think that might be um, kind of the question that we have there. Okay, um, we have someone who's a PhD in biophysics, molecular biology, and bioinformatics, but have first author publications in that field and also have co-author publications in chemistry. Am I eligible? Yeah, absolutely. This person sounds pretty interdisciplinary, which is what we're, we're looking for in Cassie. So uh, yes, I would say that person is eligible. Um, what about um, if the applicant has accepted a non-tenure position? Is the applicant still eligible? So I would probably need more information. If they're accepting a non-tenure track research position at another institution and they are applying for a postdoctoral award at Vanderbilt, that might um, cause issues. Um, but if they're planning on staying at uh, the institution, it should be fine. Okay. Um, I do have one here, and perhaps someone can put this in the chat, but finding the requirements for submitting the pre-proposal, maybe we could put that in the chat box um, because there might just be a, need, a link that we can do. Sure, sure. Millie, could you put the link, or Russ, the link to the RFP? Russ has got it. And we're going to be sending some information um, post-webinar, um, some documents that Rose Welcome have provided us, and we can send it to you once this is over, um, including links and, and whatnot. Um, okay, about another eligibility question, PhD is in cognitive neuroscience, and I'm using computational approaches in my postdoc. Am I eligible? I'm guessing yes. Uh, yes, but they might run into problems. So that's one we get every year. Um, there's a lot of that in the neuroscience is really becoming a very computational these days. Um, they will probably need to ask for an exception when they use the eligibility quiz because the eligibility quiz will ask for degrees and will probably uh, require my approval. But yes, we do approve those regularly. Okay. Um, let's see. Tell me about... Um... You, we had sort of discussed this in our practice, but the characteristics of a successful Cassie Award recipient, what are some of the things that you see in a, a successful recipient? Lou, do you want to start there and then I can fill in with anything I can think of? Yeah, you know, again, I think it's about, um, I think it's about the excitement around the proposal, the innovation. Um, again, we do not want to necessarily fund you know, something that is the next incremental step in a pretty well-trodden path. We're looking for innovation, creativity, fostering new ideas. Um, we're not risk averse. We actually view that as a plus. But we also look at the candidate's track record as well. Have they been single in, in big ideas forward in the past? Is it achievable in, you know, sort of the time frame of the application as well? And so, again, all assuming that it fits within the framework of what Cassie is meant to foster in terms of interdisciplinarity. Um, we do look forward to, um, again, taking, taking bigger risks, asking bigger questions, and, um, you know, really launching an area that, you know, otherwise might not get funded by other organizations at that stage. Well said. Yeah, I will say um, we're really interested in, in funding people not projects. So when, when people usually come to me and say, what about this project? Are you guys excited about this project or that project? That's not really what we fund. We're, we're looking for, you know, like Lou said, innovative, well-crafted proposals. 
um, that show evidence that you are the one who can to make this happen, um, these unique ideas. So that's, that's where we put our, our main focus. Okay, what about um, um, if someone magically, wonderfully was able to hold two Burroughs Welcome Funds um, have, uh, awards at one time, is that possible? <laughs> So um, another award that some of our um, applicants will probably be eligible for is the Postdoc Diversity Enrichment Program. So that's a smaller award uh, meant to uh, help uh, underrepresented minorities uh, with some opportunities, funds to attain training and, and really just some discretionary funds to, to move their research forward, to attend conferences and whatnot. And so we've had several instances of um, PDEP, which is what the acronym awardees then transition into a CAFI, but they cannot hold them at the same time. So no, you cannot hold two BWF awards if you are um, lucky enough to um, apply for two and, and, and get them. Uh, you can't hold them both at the same time, but we do um, love that pipeline to go in through from the, the diversity award to, to CAFI. Um, if I could clarify just a little bit more. So those are our competitive award program. Um, some individuals could, can have a competitive award and then one of our ad hoc awards if it's for a meeting or workshop or something like that. So that's around two of our competitive award programs. Very true, very true. If um, somebody reaches out to us and has a really great workshop or outreach uh, activity that falls in line with us, we're happy to support that as well. And, and I, actually a lot of our awardees do do that. Once they have our award, will let us know that they're chairing a conference or chairing a subcommittee and, and we'll happily provide ad hoc support to those um, activities as well. That's a good clarification. Um, okay, so what about, um, can an applicant write a proposal with the same mentor he or she is doing a current postdoc? Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, the idea is that, that not that you're gonna be doing another postdoc and, and, and going somewhere else, but the, the work you're currently doing um, with your postdoc now is, is definitely what um, is most funded. Okay. Um, we've talked about this, but in a different way, if um, the applicant accepts a non-tenure position, can the applicant still apply? A non-tenure position uh, in academia, most likely would be eligible. Um, are those awards intended for faculty appointment to be at the same institution as the postdoc? No. Uh, so we definitely um, have had our awardees go all over the US and Canada. And that's the only requirement is that the appointment cannot be outside of North America. Um, we've actually had, I'd say maybe three or four um, who have gotten uh, faculty positions outside of the U.S. and Canada, and they have had to let the faculty portion lapse. Um, but no, we don't expect you to stay at the same institution. We expect you to uh, make a competitive, um, enter the job market super competitive and, and go what, where's the best fit is for you. Okay. Um, about how much percentage of the funding can be used for project support? Melanie, do you want to take that one? We do have um, some limits on how much can be used for salary support and then the rest for um, activities. Yes, we. it, it really um, depends on your budget. Uh, the award is flexible in that nature in that as, depending on the stage you are at, at your award, if you're a postdoc or faculty, a certain percentage of the award can be used for salary and um, also a certain percentage can be used for um, fringe benefits such as health insurance. Um, there are stipulations, for example, on um, certain purchases of equipment and things of that nature getting prior approval. But um, the award is pretty flexible, except with those um, salary um, constraints. If you choose to use the award for salary, 
Um, but those are outlined uh, in the RFP. And um, in the coming year, there may be a few tweaks to those, but primarily they will stay the same. Okay, how about, this is a follow-up to the sponsor affiliation question. Um, my sponsor's main appointment is on the Vanderbilt Medical Center side, but it has courtesy appointment in the Vanderbilt University side. Does that check the box for sponsor eligibility? That might be a Larry question. I, I know Vanderbilt recently separated, right, from the university and, and the medical center. Is the medical center still considered a degree granting institute? Yeah. The medical center is not considered a degree granting institution, but anybody who has a faculty appointment, anybody in a clinical department who has a faculty appointments, appointment is in Vanderbilt University as a faculty. Great. Yeah, so then there shouldn't be any issue as, as far Correct. as I, I see. Correct. Great, yeah, so yeah, I would encourage them. They, the, it might just be an issue of who does the institutional signing. Um, right. Um, okay, what about, let's see, as if anyone has spent some time in applying for postdocs from their home country without holding any official position, would that be considered in total 60 months? Hmm. So if they had done postdoc work in their home country as well as here in the United States, yes, that would count towards their uh, 60 months. Okay. Um, this person has a background research focus that involves physical therapy and public health. Is that um, are they eligible? That is really cool. <laughs> um, but no, it's not exactly aligned with, uh, with this program. Okay. Um, so in terms of the publication requirement, what about manuscripts on preprints, submitted, accepted, but not published, or on bioarchive? So um, we, we absolutely are, are firm on the one public um, published man, um, publication that, that you have to have at least one first author publication from your graduate work or your postdoctoral work. Um, however, when we do allow, is that in the full proposal, Melanie, um, additional publications? So yes, um, in the pre-proposal, we do ask for a list of your five top publications. And those can be from um, preprints. Yes. Yes. And, and then Our the full proposal. Yes. In the full proposal, we do ask for um, for you to upload copies of some of those publications yeah. as well. Right. But the 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 first the the first author publication um, requirement um, does not include preprints. What about um, is there an advisory committee requirement um, training component to this award? Oh, yeah, I've gotten that a couple times based on, um, I guess that's the, it's typical of the K99 is required, requires that. And no, we don't require a, a lengthy training um, plan. Uh, we do, you know, the pre-proposal is very short. It's 4,000 characters. So we really are more interested in that big picture idea. Uh, when you get to the full proposal stage, or even the interview, if you want to talk about, you know, your research, your mentoring plan, um, that's welcome to, you're welcome to, but it's not a requirement. Okay, and just another clarification, um, in case it was asked, can we hold or apply for a K99 grant in parallel? You can apply. We, we have a lot of people who apply for both. Um, and um, even this year, we've had a couple of our awardees get both. Um, but then at, at that point, you have to make a decision whether you're going to accept the Cassie Award or you're going to accept the K99 because you cannot hold both at the same time. But we don't bar anybody from applying. Okay. Um, all right. What do you mean by a commitment to pursue a faculty position slash scientific career and how do we demonstrate that commitment? Um, it's really simple. It's a, part of the eligibility quiz. We ask if you are planning to pursue um, an academic, you know, uh, research, independent research program. Um, if for some reason, and it's, it's um, not as um, frequent, but it does happen, um, our postdocs who are CASI awardees 
uh, leave for academia or leave academia for industry or for some other job, um, then uh, that faculty portion um, is not, they're not eligible to receive the faculty portion. So um, it's as simple as, as clicking the box that you are intend to pr pursue um, academic appointment. Okay. Um, also talking about the mentor letter, um, what are some of the things that you look for in that mentor letter? Uh, you know, is the support there? Is this person uh, thought of highly in their, in, by their mentor? Um, can they demonstrate um, all the things that they, they, they are claiming to, to be able to do in, the, in this proposal? Um, Lou, what else do you look for in a good mentor letter? You know, about, about how independently their thought processes really mm -hmm. drove the questions and the answers and how they were ability, able to navigate, you know, solutions and about, and about connectivity and collaboration and reaching out to other people to help them solve problems. Those are the things that, you know, to me distinguish a, 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 a really thoughtful mentor letter from a, for an applicant. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about involvement in scientific outreach? Does it boost an application? Specifically, should the application only mention research achievements? Uh, for, for, for Cassie, yes. I think the, the main focus is on the research for this award. Um, I think the, a great place to put the, um, your commitment to outreach and, and other um, endeavors is in your personal statement. If you get um, through the, the full proposal stage, we have um, a place for a personal statement, and that's a really great way to show um, the people are, are well-rounded and, and civically minded and, and, um, and yeah. So we're, we're actually very committed to science communication and, and science mm -hmm. outreach at the Burroughs Welcome Fund. And, you know, as part of all of what we're doing for our new awardees meeting this year is we're actually giving them an experience in science communication because we think it should be part and parcel of what we all do as scientists. And so um, it doesn't have to be an implicit or explicit part of the application. Um, if they want to put in how they will, you know, convey this broadly, I think if they can keep it within the bounds and still convey the science, it, it adds. And then the personal statement is a great place. Um, but we do look fo forward to fostering that endeavor for all of our uh, awardees. Absolutely. Well said. Um, okay, we have a question again more about neuroscience, interdisciplinary neuroscience research and elaborating on that. We're proposing to use a Vanderbilt core outside of the neuroscience area count. That one I think probably requires a discussion to find out exactly what the details are. It's hard to, to make a generalization call right here. I, I'd encourage them to, to um, my email address or we'll put that in the chat as well. Okay. Um, let's see, is a J1 visa holder doing postdoc for one year considered to be a US temporary citizen? Yes. Okay. And um, is the review papers um, can be included in the publication record? They can. Okay. Um, okay. I think those are most of our um, big questions. Looking in the chat box, there's a lot of links, um, a lot of information in the chat um, about how to um, connect with Burroughs Welcome, how to find all the, the resources that you need. Um, I'd like to propose that we've had so many very specific questions that if um, we want to, we could possibly close out, but if anyone has any remaining ones that they, you know, want to ask, almost like we were sticking around after the seminar to talk with people. Um, sure. If you wanted to stick around and, and ask, I'm sure that um, everyone here happy. is welcome, would want to, would be happy to, to talk. Um, and then we could, we could do that. Um, just a couple, let's see, a couple more questions here. Can you comment on when is the ideal time to apply for this award? Um, That's a great question. Okay. Yeah, I think the most competitive people are nearing the end of their postdoc. So they've gotten a couple of really good papers out. They, they've got a clear idea what their lab's going to be and they're, they're ready um, 
to start going on that faculty um, hunt soon. Um, and so the timing is, is tricky, uh, depending on what field you're in. Um, some physicists, for example, only take, you know, a couple year postdoc, don't do that whole, the 60 months to them sounds like an incredibly long time. Um, so I'm, I don't try to give any um, years for that reason, because, you know, a neuroscience um, postdoc looks very different than a theoretical physicist postdoc. Um, but yeah, it, it, in short, if you've gotten um, some good publications and you're ready to uh, go on the faculty job market within that next year or two, uh, that's, that's the time to be, to be applying. It is a, it's a very competitive program. <laughs> You know, and I think to be successful, you really have to have that evidence of, you know, impact from your, your, your work in the past. And usually that means at least one substantial, you know, publication, um, usually from the postdoc period um, uh, as well. So I think it, while the requirement is one publication at any point in your career, if you can have a strong publication from your postdoc, I think more often than not, that's what it takes to be competitive. Agreed. Um, I know you mentioned briefly one, another um, opportunity to apply for a, a different Burr's Welcome Fund, but what are some of the other, um, can you speak to the additional career development opportunities available for trainees outside of these funds, these CASI funds? Mm -hmm. So there's the postdoctoral enrichment program. There is the career awards for medical scientists. And I think those, that's well, and I, I, I can also say, you know, once you're part of the Burroughs Welcome Fund awarding network, we are deeply committed to navigating opportunities and career development for you. So that those, I, Kelly mentioned our other career award programs, right. but um, we, um, we, we look forward to advancing the careers of our awardees very strongly. That's certainly what happened for me as an awardee back in 1995. So that means helping you negotiate your first um, faculty appointment, um, helping you through details along the way in Bumps Road as you're thinking about uh, the tenure process around the time clock, and then also providing opportunities, things like um, uh, networking opportunities. For COVID-19, for example, mm -hmm. we opened up a collaborative unplanned research grant opportunity for our network of awardees to apply for funds in the very short term. We turned that around within one month. Um, and then at our uh, new awardees uh, meeting, we're, we're constantly bringing people together to try to foster uh, new engagement. So um, I think uh, we put out many publications around career development already, making the right moves and, and other <laughs> things. Um, so, uh, and we're just getting ready to put out the second round of that. Um, uh, so we, this is an area that we're, we're very committed to. I, I wish we could do it for all of our, our, our applicants, not just our awardees, um, but we do look forward to really helping the people that are part of our family. Yes, maybe Russ, you can talk a little bit about the, the different uh, publications we've got that are ac accessible to everyone. Sure, we, we have a number of publications on our website. If you go to our website under Career Tools, and I'll post that in the chat. But we've done a number, number of publications in addition to Making the Right Moves, which was, I think, originally done in 2002, maybe 2003, with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And it, it's basically the business of running your lab. We put out some other uh, books about communicating science, about how to hire staff. Um, basically, we, we try to think about things that, as a... Uh, a budding independent researcher or um, principal investigator you might need for your lab. So we, we've we um, put out a number of those. I'll post those in the chat. And and we're constantly updating content on our, our Twitter feed at BW Fund. I keep promoting that, but that's my job. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Russ. Um, okay, I think that is most of our questions. If um, anyone would like to stay on and I can let you, allow you to talk um, too, to, to the folks here. Um, but I appreciate everyone coming. I'll be sending a follow-up email with information and other links um, so that you can, you can have that. And then um, just, yeah, thank you for coming. Stick around if you like, and uh, we'll open up, open up the, the talking. Thank, thank you. you everyone.